I'm a real wild boy. Wild boy. Wild boy. Wild boy. Wild boy. Welcome to Sophie Willard's Guide to Normality. <laughs> from a long line of eccentric female Boltonians. One in six of us believe we've been abducted by aliens. <laughs> One in three of us believe we are an alien. <laughs> and these are the same ones. <laughs> the only way to describe the rest, Take a Break is less of a magazine to me and more of a family album. <laughs> Honestly, get-togethers are quite a nightmare. Like, at funerals, we bring an extra coffin just in case. <laughs> I think that madness makes you more interesting. I had an Auntie Joan who was an absolute boar until she got manic depression and started knitting clothes for the hamster. <laughs> it really gave her an edge. <laughs> so I find it very difficult to understand how to do normal everyday things like love a small human, love an adult human and get a job. And over this series, I'm going to dissect and discover just what it takes to be normal in key areas of life. And today, we'll be focusing on parenting. My understanding is that you give birth to a large human blob that looks very much like a sad cabbage for the first six months. And then it's your responsibility to love that sad cabbage human blob, no matter how horrible it behaves. I went to live with my grandmother growing up and she had no intention of doing normal parenting on me. My grandma's quite a dramatic person and everything was very dramatic in her, our house growing up. You know, you'd come home from school, she'd be talking through the Kama Sutra with the plumber. <laughs> she looks very much like Morticia Adams. You're not quite sure she's a beauty or a crow, you know. <laughs> and she comes out with these sweeping statements, my grandma. I called her up last Christmas, right? And I invited her to a Christmas party. She says, no, Sophie, I don't want to come to a Christmas party and stand in the corner like a leftover piece of turkey. <laughs> and even if I did want to go, I couldn't possibly. I've just defrosted a loaf. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> now, I'll be honest, the reason I went to live with that grandmother is because my mum, bless her, she's actually a drug addict. I know, but don't worry, we're relieved she picked drugs <laughs> because she's a terrible mother. She just didn't get it. You know, I once cracked my head open. She took me to Morrison's. She didn't... <laughs> Motherhood just wasn't her skill set. Like, she once got inspired to cook me breakfast. It was a disaster. It was so stressful. She decided to boil me an egg. She just stood, stirring at the pan for 25 minutes, going, how do you know if it's cooked, it looks the same? <laughs> Which, to be fair, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> She's now stood under my phone as mum. Not an emergency contact. <laughs> no, she's wonderful, my mum. She's not your average kind of mum, I understand that. She looks very much like Iggy Pop does now. <laughs> if Iggy Pop could only shop on Bury Market. <laughs> and had no teeth. <laughs> I get on really well with my mum, and I get on really well with my gran, but them two don't get on well. My mum has this thing, she's got a lot of teenage angst, my mum. Like, we went out for a family meal and I knew as soon as we got there it was going to be a disaster because she started panicking, right? And I could see her panicking. She was looking through the menu, getting dead anxious, desperately trying to find something she could chew. And when she gets anxious, she just sort of is quite impulsive. So she saw this waitress and she just screamed at her from across the room. She just went, a bucket of ice to chew at my leisure. <laughs> My grandmother got really embarrassed. And when she gets embarrassed, she starts having a go at people. So she turned around to my mum, she went, when will you grace us with teeth, Lynn? <laughs> I'm getting them done on the NHS, mother. Do you want me to send you a picture? <laughs> oh, I see. You've never worked a day in your life and you'll have better teeth than all of us. <laughs> well, the government feel they want to look after me, mother, which is more than you ever did. <laughs> they're off. They start fighting, I say, look, why don't we just have creme brulee? <laughs> you don't have to chew that, do you? We could be the quirky family who just have three rounds of creme brulee. <laughs> My grandma pipes up, she says, I don't eat egg anymore. <laughs> who wants to eat the unborn child of a depressed hen? <laughs> <laughs> what do you say to that? I know they start going back and forth, they're rowing. Eventually, grandma gets up right, and she storms off. 
but she gets caught at a birthday serenade for a toddler at the next table. <laughs> so she starts awkwardly singing along and happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, right? And she's shouting across the bar, Philip Larkin, this be the verse. You know that one, they fuck you up, your mum and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. Can you imagine what that must be like for my poor grandma having to listen to somebody with no teeth recite poetry? <laughs> Anyway, she starts singing it again, doesn't she, in the restaurant? My grandma, caught behind the birthday serenade, suddenly it goes very quiet at the table. The birthday serenade all look over at my mum and the toddler starts crying. I just see my grandma look down at the toddler and go, stop crying. Sentimentality is a mental illness. <laughs> and that was the last normal parenting experience I had. <laughs> now are having babies, which is terrifying. They're all trying to do the normal parenting thing now. Do you know, one of my best friends had a baby boy on my birthday. I know, very selfish. <laughs> I called her up recently. I said, oh, we're going out for my birthday. She said, I'm so sorry, I can't. I'm throwing him a surprise party. I said, he's one. <laughs> you don't have to throw him a party to surprise him. Just pop up from behind a tea towel. <laughs> Why is he having the big soiree? What's he achieved with his sodding life? <laughs> she said, oh, well, he is potty trained now, you know. I said, so am I. <laughs> she said, not always. I said, that was one time I was very drunk. <laughs> I have to say, I do think it's probably worth having kids, though, because if you don't have kids, your personal failings are just failings, aren't they? <laughs> like, if you have kids, they're sacrifices. <laughs> I was going to be an archaeologist, but then I had you and a mild dust allergy, but mainly you. <laughs> I would have travelled the world, but then I had you and I'm frightened of flying, but mainly because of you. <laughs> if you are going to be a parent, I think you should do it young. You know, I think teen pregnancies are very, very smart. <laughs> At least you've got chance to snap back. <laughs> I'm not uh, sure if I want kids. I don't know Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I should bring a child into the world. I've been frightened of this a lot, particularly in my 20s, because when I got to 23, I got my records back from social services. Obviously, I've been in and out of the curse system, and I got these records back. And in the records, there was a file that basically explained to me that my mother has drug-induced psychosis. I had no idea until I read this notice. I just thought she was quirky. <laughs> and this is what the file said. Dr. Blur first saw Lynn in 1989 when she was suffering from drug-induced psychosis. Earlier in the week, she was expressing delusional ideas involving rock star Freddie Mercury. <laughs> Just say, if you're going to have a breakdown, let Freddie Mercury be involved. <laughs> anyway, this file went on to say that this could be a genetic predisposition inherited by a maternal uncle. Now, that uncle would be Uncle John. John's life is Monday afternoons in a Weatherspoons, laughing into a packet of port scratchings. <laughs> it was quite frightening, that, because this basically means that my gene pool is vulnerable to psychosis. And I went through all my files and there'd been so many analyses of my family background and assessments of our genetic predisposition. I'd even had psychologists come and assess me as a child and predict what problems I might have as an adult. A bit like some sort of shit mystic Meg, really. <laughs> I got very depressed, actually, after reading my files. I didn't know I was depressed. Um, the signs were there. I was having three baths a day and eating tin macaroni cheese for breakfast. <laughs> And I went to the doctor eventually. I said, I don't know what's wrong with me. I keep watching back-to-back -back episodes of Gilmore Girls. <laughs> he said, oh, you're depressed. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been for therapy on the NHS, but the first thing they do is they do an assessment. And you read it, you go, all oh, right. I thought that was an attribute to my personality. <laughs> Here it says it's a fundamental psychological flaw. <laughs> And the more I talked about the mental health issues in my family that frightened me, the less frightened I became, you know. So I, now I know how to make myself happy and well. And I wouldn't say that I struggle with my mental health. 
but I do certainly have to watch it like a disobedient child. <laughs> if left unattended, it would probably flood the bathroom and lick batteries. <laughs> I, I take star flower. It's a hormonal supplement. If you're the kind of person who wakes up randomly on a Monday and thinks, oh, I'd quite like to kill myself today. <laughs> Maybe stab the next person I see. <laughs> Starflowers for you, it really takes the edge off. <laughs> so it's positive going for therapy. I feel like that's okay. I think I would do as good a job as any normal parent at screwing that child up well. <laughs> I put together a list of the worst kinds of normal parents, right? I'll read it to you. Craft mums. <laughs> I've only got one thing to say to a craft mum. Get laid. <laughs> Facebook parents. Exactly. <laughs> Look at him, isn't he cute? He's been sick on me, isn't he? Quick, snap, snap, get it online. <laughs> Lactose-free, lentil-sowing, alternative hippie parents. <laughs> what happened to having an emergency chomp in your bag covered in fluff? <laughs> Child-centric parents in public places. I believe my child should be seen, heard, and annoying you in all the nice, quiet bars. <laughs> you don't get any of that in Manchester, do you? Well, maybe in Charlton. <laughs> on my ultimate quest to define normal parenting. Genetically, my family tree has its first share of psychotic branches. And even those of us who don't struggle with psychosis do struggle with normal. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Do you know, recently they did a study that proves that successful comedians have more psychotic traits than anybody else in any other profession. <laughs> Which is great for me, isn't it? <laughs> I do think that we need to change and reclaim the negative language that surrounds mental health issues, though. And whatever you want to say about my family, you know, no, we haven't always had the most normal, healthy style of parenting, but every single member of my family is funny. Imagine if they'd been assessed by comedy reviewers instead of psychologists. <laughs> I've written a few reviews for you, just so you can get an idea. The Guardian says, with hilarious unpredictability, absurdist comedian Uncle John discusses life and love with a packet of port scratchings. <laughs> Five stars. <laughs> the Times says, Auntie Joan delivers Alan Bennett-esque monologue without a single reference to the six hamsters wearing knitted suits on her lap. <laughs> Perfectly pitched alternative comedy. <laughs> I'd like to end this episode with my favorite poem, taught to me by my mother. Philip Larkin, this be the verse. <laughs> they fuck you up, your mum and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they add and add a few extra just for you. Man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can and don't have kids yourself. <laughs> I've been Sophie Willen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sophie Willen's Guide to Normality was written and performed by me, Sophie Willen. The producer was Susie Grant, and it was a BBC Studios production.